Good morning, Meadowbrook. So good to see you all this morning. Um, I was a senior in college. I was actually a super senior in college. Um, and I had just gotten out of what was like almost a three-year relationship with somebody. And it was one of those relationships where I knew that I needed to just find a way out and into the next part of my life. And I was living in this house at the time with these seven guys who were, we were all great friends. These were just awesome Christian guys. And so I can remember as this relationship was ending, and it was opening up into this like new era of my life, this new time in my life. This is going to be my last semester of college. I think I had two classes. I was just going to have a lot of time on my hands. Uh, I had a lot of friends that I had made throughout college, so it was just a lot of hanging out with the guys I lived with, hanging out with the friends that I had made. Uh, one of those kind of blissful moments in life. Um, and it was just a cool time that I remember. I look back on it really fondly. But it didn't take long, just a couple months, before I started spending time with some of my friends who, who were girls. I would just, we'd go out for coffee, we'd hang out. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. And I remember on one particular day, you know, I got coffee with one of my friends. I, again, I'm not thinking anything of it. And then later on in the day, I think I played some broom ball with another one of my friends later in the day. And so I'm coming home at night, you know, it's probably 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, and I'm walking into the house, and all the guys are around. And uh, one of my good friends um, was there. He, I lived with him. His name's Danny. He was making some food in the kitchen. And Danny is this hilarious guy. I absolutely love Danny. Danny's on the left, by the way. I think we're, we're drinking apple cider. Um, we actually were. We, we, we made some apple cider, and then we were drinking it. Um, but he's, I love Danny because he's this straight shooter kind of guy. I don't know if you have a person like that in your life who is just a straight shooter, but he's also so hilarious. So he's like serious, but also so funny at the same time. And so he would always just like push me on stuff because, again, he loves Jesus and he loves me. And so I walk into the house and I remember him asking me about like the, you know, oh, so you went out for coffee earlier today. Who did you go with? And, you know, I told him who I went with and, and his response was, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, go on. And what about tonight? Who did you play broomball with? And I, and I told him the other person who I played broomball with. And I was just like, and in my mind, I'm like, you know, we're just friends. And to which he said, he would say this, you just have to know his personality and his tone, but he would say it in this kind of like serious and dismissive and hilarious tone at all at the same time. He'd just look at me and go, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. And I started to defend myself a little bit because I was uncomfortable with where he was going, right? Like, I could already tell. He was like, okay, so you went to coffee with her, and then you went and played broom ball with her? Sure. Just friends, right? I could see that he had a problem with my kind of, like, back-and-forth nature, hanging out with these friends, and, and honestly, I was not even thinking about what they're thinking. Just no, no thought process for that. We're just friends. And so I re remember walking into the living room, walking out of the kitchen, and I'm laughing. Ha ha, Danny, okay. It's funny. We used to yell stuff at each other from across the house. You might remember how this kind of thing happens when you're in college. You just do r ridiculous things. We would yell hilarious things at each other. So he used that tone, but he, it wasn't funny. He was being serious. I could tell he was being serious because he yelled from across the house at me as I was walking away from him. He goes, you don't even know what you want. And I, I, it was funny. But honestly, I didn't respond because I was internally, I was like, he's right. Like, like I didn't have to say anything. It was just like, he's right. I actually don't know what I want. And um, it was one of those moments where it just hit me. I don't know if you've had moments like that where something hits you at a core level. Somebody says something, they don't even mean it to hit at that level. And yet, something, and I believe, honestly, looking back, it was the voice of God speaking even through my friend in that moment, speaking something to the core of who I was. And you see, the problem for me wasn't that I got coffee with a friend. The problem wasn't that I went and played a sport with a friend. The problem was that the guys in my life knew me well enough to know that I had a distinct tendency to use romantic relationships as a buffer for engaging with myself and as a buffer for engaging with God. And they knew that. And, and you see, my whole life from age 15 up until that point in my life, it was pretty much just different 
relationships. I, 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 you could have asked me, like, why have you been in so many different relationships? I wouldn't have even known what to say to you. I would, I would have just been like, I, I guess I don't know. I just feel like I need to be or something. And looking back, it seems obvious that God was inviting me to go deeper, to know him more, to go deeper into the places where he is at the core of my life. And, and he's inviting each of us to go to those places. But that can actually be kind of scary. It can be kind of scary to go to that place. And here's why that, this matters. Because whether you're like me and you have had your issues with relationships in the past, or maybe it's a dynamic with a relationship you have to technology, where it kind of is just this buffer. It causes you to not go deeper. Or, or maybe it's to work. How many of us think, man, I could just spend hours and hours and hours of work. And, and work is good. But does it keep you from going deeper into the core of who God is and from knowing yourself as well. It could be a dynamic where something small just turned into an addiction and now all of a sudden you use it as a buffer. Or, or a small worry like turned into a thinking pattern and now all of a sudden you have this anxious kind of life. And, and that, like me, most of us, you, you start looking and you're like, I'm participating in these things that cause me to not know who I am and not know what I actually want. Or worse yet, we think we know what we want but then we get it and we realize, I don't know what I want. And this matters because as I was reflecting this summer uh, on our journey through the book of Colossians, it hit me that I've read this letter to the Colossians so many times. You might be like me this morning. You've read throughout the whole New Testament like dozens of times. You've read the Old Testament maybe a number of times, maybe dozens of times. And, and it hit me like I didn't want this to just be another series or something where you get good information and then you kind of check the box and you're like, okay, Colossians, got it. Romans, check mark, got it. Like there's nothing wrong with good information, but, but something has to hit deeper. Something about the barriers that we set up in our own life so that God could do something with that in our life. Like, that's what I actually want. And so I was convicted this week by God that I didn't want to have the tendency that I so often have, which is what the Israelites had. Uh, God says this about his people in the book of Isaiah. He says, These people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their hearts are far from me. They worship me based on merely human rules that they have been taught. And so I thought, how often do I read the Bible to learn something from it here? But ultimately, the trajectory and the growth that I long for in my life is stunted, and I can't really figure out why. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Like, I keep learning good information, but I'm, I don't know if I'm changing. Like, I want to change more. And God convicted me this week, like, why don't you go into that? Why don't you go into that? And why does my heart, why, why does your heart simultaneously long for God and yet we so often settle for lesser things that can sap the energy out of our worship of him? In other words, I want nothing more than for Colossians but for the good news about Jesus to soar in your life. Like, let's take down the barriers in our life. And so this morning, we're going to look at a story that's going to cause us to examine our hearts because it's a story about a man that Scripture calls a man after God's own heart. It's a story that can be found in 2 Samuel and chapter 11. We're actually going to start in chapter 11. So this is a familiar story to many of us. It's a difficult story in some ways. But in many ways, we're actually not going to get, like, we're not going to focus too, too hard on the actual story. We're going to ask questions about this man, David, this man after God's own heart, uh, how he was able to be a man after God's own heart when it certainly doesn't look like he is in the story that we're going to read. So let's read that. I'm just going to read 2 Samuel 11, starting in verse 1 here. In the spring... At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, there's something interesting going on here because this is David, the one who killed Goliath when nobody else would. Like, this is the fearless little David that looked at the giant Goliath and was like, what, this guy? You're scared of this guy? Like that was David's heart. That was who he was. And yet now here he is. He's the king. 
And what does it say? It says that it was springtime, and it's the time when kings go off to war. And where was David? At home. Something changed in David. Because what is about to happen, it may have never happened if David had done what he was supposed to have done in the first place, which was be the king. Go do what God is calling you to do. Uh, David let the benefits of being the king cloud his judgment. Because what happens next is one of the most widely known stories in the Bible. It's about David from his high perch on the palace roof. And from the palace, you can see the whole entire city of Jerusalem. And from there, he sees a beautiful woman, and he sees her, and he asks his attendants about her, and he uses his power to take advantage of this person who was married as king. He does something horrible. And so, wow, how is David's heart doing? This is the man after God's own heart. And and yet, how is his heart doing? It doesn't seem to be doing well. But let's just pause judgment for a moment. Let's pause judgment and just recognize what's happening to this good man. This good man, because I would argue that it doesn't just happen to David, that it happens to every single one of us in many different ways ways. And the first thing is this. It's that leisure, money, and power, they have the potential to corrupt our hearts. It, we, can, we can focus on what David did, but let's, let's look behind that. What was going on with David? I mean, wasn't he this fearless king, this shepherd boy who had no fear? Yeah, he was, but leisure, money, and power started getting into his life. To put it another way, leisure, money, and power, they have the potential to cause you and I to believe that we are self-sufficient. Like we're not accountable to anyone. We're not accountable to God even. And now in David's day, there were very few people who were afforded this kind of time, money, and power. It was pretty much just kings, right? People who were in royalty. But think about it. In our day, because of technological advancement, because of where we're at as a society, I think we are all in David's shoes. In in fact, today, if you had the choice of living just a very simple life in the Western world or living the life of King David, we would all choose to live in today's world. We all, to a certain degree, live as kings and queens. So when we read these stories and we say, I would never do that. No, it's talking about us, you guys. It's talking about us. And not only that, but we have access not to just like one Bathsheba-like temptation. We have access to thousands. I mean, take your pick. It's all accessible in the modern world. And so it's not just a question about a man who lived 3,000 years ago. It's actually a question about you, and it's a question about me and the way that we live. Because here's the thing. We go into this text today with the assumption that your heart matters. Your heart matters. Your heart matters to God. You might not think about your heart that often, but think about you, your, your heart is like at the core of who you are as a person, right? Think about your physical heart. I, I called the physical heart gross this, this morning in first service. I said, it's such a gross thing. Like it's pumping blood. A doctor came up to me after service and he said, heart's not gross. <laughs> he said, let, let me just put it on the record that the heart's not gross. I know there's a lot of doctors in the room here today, but it's kind of, I'm just going to say it, it's kind of gross, Isn't it? You get all this blood, it's pumping around. But think about it. It is the life source. And it has to keep pumping, doesn't it? It's not like it can take a break. That's unbelievable. This thing is just going and it's pumping and it's the life source taking in and out, in and out. And the way that that scripture talks about your heart, it's like this spiritual, spiritual organ out of which flows your connection to God. Now, in the book of Colossians, we learn that God is everywhere, right? But there's a more specific way of talking about where God lives. And Scripture talks about it like it's at the core of who you are. It's at your heart. In fact, we could say this is where God lives. Like we wonder where he is. He's right here at the core of who you are, at the fundamental level of who you are. And so the problem here isn't just that David did a terrible thing. He did. It was a terrible thing that David get, did. But the fact, uh, and the story goes on actually to talk about what he also did. He tried to cover his tracks and then he committed premeditated murder. So he took a bad situation and it got even worse. But even worse than that is allowing your sin to take over and to do horrible things, but then to actually respond to it by thinking 
that now I am what I did. Believing the lie that I am what I did. Believing and over-identifying with our sin because it's just so bad. And that's every single person in this room. That is the human story. And so you can see why somebody like David who did stuff like this, why he might over-identify with his sin. And we can just say, David, yeah, it was really bad. He was not a good guy in this moment. But it's the exact kind of behavior that in our modern day would have gotten David like impeached out of office, right? Like he would have been sent into jail if a president did the stuff that he did. And yet I want to argue that it's at our worst moments. It's how we respond that makes all the difference. It's how you respond at your worst moments that makes all the difference in the world. And it is the key to understanding why David is called a man after God's own heart. It's because of what he did next. And so let, let's read what happens next. This is in chapter 12, starting with verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. Then the Lord, Yahweh, sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, the other was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, he grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food, it drank from his cup, it even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. And instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Now, listen to this. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you're the man. You're the man. Now, I want you to remember who David is. Who is he? Is he like a powerful, arrogant king that just takes advantage of women? I mean, kings in the ancient world, that's what they did. Is that what, who David is? Or was he the little shepherd boy out in the field, brave, He'd see a lion or a bear come and he'd take his sling and he would kill it. Like it didn't, it didn't make him scared. Like which David was it? Is he the prideful king or the little boy? Is he the villain or is he the hero in the story? Because we have to recognize something in our own lives that being confronted with failure is actually just an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you. The, the reality is that God is already there in the depth of your heart. God is already there. He already sees it. He already knows us. But all too often, we convince ourselves that nobody knows. Nobody could understand. <laughs> nobody would be able to resonate with where we're at in this moment. But the reality for David is that he was blessed to have a friend like Nathan, wasn't he? He was blessed to have a friend like Nathan, somebody who would listen to God. Do you have a friend in your life who listens to God? It doesn't mean that everything they say is like scripture truth, but somebody in your life who you look at them and you say, I trust your relationship with God. I trust that you're seeking him. It says in verse 1, it says that the Lord sent Nathan. The Lord sent him. And I wonder if you have a Nathan in your life. Somebody who has been sent by God to speak to you in those moments where you need to hear from him. You know, I, I mentioned the story uh, at the beginning about just my weaknesses with uh, relationships in my past. Um, but we can allow these sorts of areas in our life. It's probably something different for you. But you can allow them to kind of grow and grow. And it can really like cloud and mask the way that you're seeing the world. And sometimes we need somebody to just speak into our lives. And so I'm reminded of a time... Uh, Prior to getting married, I was dating uh, my wife, Trish, and uh, we were up, uh, me and a couple of my friends spent a week up at Fort Wilderness. We were painting the Woodland Lodge one week and just having a blast and being 20-year-old guys. Uh, but there was more going on in my heart at the time. 
because I was wondering and I was conflicted over all of these you know, relationship questions. And m my friend, Drew, who I've known my whole entire life, um, and we've spent so many countless hours talking, we've lived together on a couple different occasions, and he's just a guy who knows me inside and out. He's seen me at every single phase of my life. It's like I didn't even have to ask him any question. There was a moment we were sitting around a fire and he just looked at me and it's almost, I, I do think it was like look, the Lord gave him this word to speak to me because there was just, he, he could perceive that I needed to hear it and he just looked at me and he said, Nate, I just want you to know that you are my best friend and you're an amazing guy. And I think that whatever ends up happening with you in the future and in your relationship, that nothing's going to change that. You're just a beautiful person. Which, saying it sounds a little bit odd, but it wasn't odd. It was actually exactly what my heart needed to hear at the moment, to just be affirmed that, okay, God, it was like God was speaking to me and just affirming who I was. And so I wonder if you have somebody like that. Or if you've had people like that in your life, who's a Nathan in your life, I wonder if there's a person who just sees you for who you are. Because here's the reality. It's your heart that's on the line. It's your heart that's on the line. Like our willingness to be seen for who we are, it's really not for God's sake. I mean, God already sees you. And it's really not for your friend's sake because if you have a good friend like Nathan in your life, they're not going to be offended by hearing anything about your life. So who is it for? It's for you. It's your heart that's on the line. Our willingness to be broken or just to be ourselves intentionally in front of somebody else is what some of you are waiting for this morning. In fact, you've been waiting for God to stir you possibly. You've been waiting for God to change you. Or maybe you've been waiting for like something in your life just to break or change to get you out of the funk that you're in or this holding pattern that you're in. You've been waiting to take the next step. Maybe you look at your life and just say, yeah, but it's just too much. It's just too much. Like others wouldn't understand. But I'm telling you, whatever it is, it's not half as bad as whatever David did. <laughs> it's not. Like, like whatever it is, it's probably not half as bad as him. And yet David showed his true heart when Nathan came to him. He showed what loving God looks like. You see, loving God could not have been about David's actions because his actions weren't good. It was about his heart. And loving God is about your heart. It's not only about your heart when things are going well. It's about your heart in these moments when you've done your worst. And the question is always, now what? Now what? What's the next step? You know what's beautiful? David shows us just what kind of a beautiful heart he is because he actually wrote about it in his journal. Now, thank God that my journal is not in Scripture or your journal. Uh, but David's journal is in Scripture. And so he writes about this scenario. It's like right after this happened, he wrote about it. And it's in Psalm chapter 51. Now, you don't need to open to it. You can if you want. But I'm just going to read a few verses from the beginning. This is how David, this is like looking into what's going on in here, in David's heart. This is what he says to God. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right, God. You're right in your verdict and you're justified when you judge me. And you see, David had courage to do what very few of us have courage to do. And that's just admit it. Just admit that there was fault, that, that there was no one else to blame. He was the king. Think about it. He could have self-protected. He could have self-isolated. He could have covered his track. He could have taken all the people who knew about what he did and he could have had them all killed. And he could have doubled down and tripled down and just made sure that I'm the king and it doesn't matter what I do. And yet, what does he do? He actually shows us that his pain is not an excuse for him to isolate or an excuse for him to rage or an excuse for him to take out vengeance. His pain was self-inflicted. Like, those might be normal feelings that we have, but when we've made our own mess, we have the option to either isolate ourselves or to accept, to say what David said, said and just say, God, you're right. You're right. It was me. You know, for David, he was told by God that there would be a consequence for this, that this child that came from his taking of Bathsheba would end up dying as a result of David's sin. And man, sometimes our, our sin, our choices, they have consequences. 
And usually they're not as bad as this, but I think God used this situation to show David his own brokenness and to highlight David's heart. In fact, the text says that David, what he did when he heard about this, he spent a week fasting and a week in prayer before God. And in fact, his brokenness caused him to to push deeper into the heart of God, which leads us to a question, like, where does your brokenness lead you? Are you like David? Like, he was willing to go there, even in his brokenness, to be led further into the heart of God. Because on a heart level, it can really only go one of two directions. It will either be to put up the walls and deny, 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 or it can be to accept, to know that God already knows. God already sees. He sees me even in the midst of my brokenness. And there's something that happened if we're willing to go there. It's beautiful. In fact, the story of David, it shows us what can happen when we allow our hearts to be like soft and moldable by God. When David found out that his child would die and that in fact it had died, you know what he did? This is what it says in 2 Samuel 12 verse 20. David got up from the ground. After he had washed and put on lotions, he changed his clothes, and then he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. He worshiped. That was David's response. You see, David shows us what God will do with the heart of a person who's honest and straightforward, a heart that doesn't avoid the truth, but it's just willing to hear it, willing to be honest. He shows us that a life of worship is born out of a heart that's honest with God, and that's an awesome thing. Getting to a place of honesty with God is such a good thing. You see, there's something about allowing ourselves to just be seen by God and known by God and forgiven by God that causes us to worship him. Like, so many of us, like, that's the beautiful thing that we want. We want more worship. Like, we're like, God, give me more of yourself. And God's like, yeah, I will. But come to me in honesty. You see, when worship, when we're pretending, it's like that text from Isaiah. It's like coming to God with our lips but withholding our hearts. Have you ever met with a friend and you can just tell that they're like talking to you but they're not actually there? They're somewhere else? I've been like that. I've had coffee with people like that, right? Like their lips are there, they're saying the stuff, but I don't think they're actually there. And here's the real takeaway for us this morning. Like don't be afraid of being seen by God. Don't be afraid of it. It's a good thing to be seen by God. Don't, don't even be afraid of God breaking you because if he's going to break any part of you, it's only because he's going to build you up again. Let him see you because he already sees you. But it's your part in, in saying yes to that process that opens you up to the heart of God and that reminds you that here is your creator and he loves you and he knows you and he sees you just as you are. And he doesn't send you away, but he purifies you in the process. And the amazing part of this story of David's is that in his own life, he probably had no idea what God would do with his faithfulness. Like, what was next? What, how would God make a good situation out of this? He couldn't even imagine how his faithfulness to be exposed before God would result in anything good for anyone else. But I want us to recognize where this was all leading in his story. Because in this story... The payment for these huge mistakes was the life of his son, David's son. I mean, this was a huge loss. And sometimes our sin costs us something. And David shows us that there's a God that's, that's worthy of worship, even in like really horrible, difficult situations. But God actually uses it to show us where it was leading in the giving of his own son. I mean, that's where this is leading Like, God is leading to Jesus. Like, he's leading to giving his own son. You see, David had what was coming to him, but Jesus never sinned. Like, Jesus wasn't like David. Like, David experienced pain for his mistakes, but Jesus never should have had to experience any kind of pain. He never should have had to experience it. Like, God was the last one who should have been blamed or taken on the pain of our sin, and yet God, in his great love for us because of his nature, he did it. He looked at us. He looked at our tendency to mask what's real, our tendency to build up the walls, to deny, deny, deny. Some of us just to live whole lives that are just out of step with him. I mean, that's been my life at so many different points. And yet God looks at David and he looks at us and he looks at you and he sees you. He loves you just the way you are. He sees the garbage. He sees past all the garbage. 
into the inner recesses of your heart, and he sees who you actually are, like David, the little boy out in the field. He, that's who God sees when he looks at David, and God sees that when he looks at you, who you actually are, even through all of the unlovable aspects of us, and he loves you enough to die for you. God said, I would do it. I would give my son. I'll take on the pain and the ramifications and the consequences of anything that you've done. And so do you see it? There's really only one of two ways to live. I mean, there's only one, like you have two options really. Like one way to live is just born out of an illusion that like my life is basically good and bad decisions and if I do good stuff, good stuff will happen to me and if I do bad stuff, I'll get bad stuff happening to me. And it just gets to actually be kind of an exhausting way of life for everyone around you, when we operate like that, it just exhausts us because we're always like operating on this perfection scale. And, and if that's you this morning, like I'm just here to tell you that Jesus offers you a different way to live. He offers you to just take a rest, like really find some rest in him because there's a better way. There's a second option this morning. And it's the process by which you can start to practice accepting God's love in your life regularly. And it's the sort of stuff I have to do just every single day. I'm working on this all the time. But like the first thing is just recognize your brokenness. God already recognizes it. it not, not a newsflash to God, actually. None of your brokenness is a newsflash. He already he sees you just as you are. And don't, you don't need to worry about anyone else's brokenness. God will worry about them. But just recognize your own brokenness. And the second one is this. Just Listen to God speaking to you through a trusted person. Now, I will talk about a lot, and a lot of times in church we talk about, like, practice listening to God, and that's really important. But we don't really mention very often, what about listening to God through another person who's speaking to you, that God might be speaking to you through another person? We need a Nathan in our lives. The third one is just to speak plainly back to God. Like, this is our part. Like, God is speaking to us, and we have the ability to speak plainly to him. Now, I want to call it just having these Psalm 51 type moments in our life. Um, it doesn't mean that every single moment of your life has to be this like huge, intense, emotional like experience. Like it's probably not. But Psalm 51 is a great example of a man whose heart loved God and he was willing to be transparent with God. And so I wonder, like, are you having those sorts of Psalm 51 type moments in your life where you can just speak plainly to God. It's actually what I practice doing all the time when I go on, on walks. I just try to speak plainly to God. And, and the result of that is going to be to worship. Worship is the result, right? Everything is going to change now when we realize that God had no obligation to save us from the effects of sin in our world, and yet he did. And the only appropriate response then is to worship. And so are you reminding yourself of Jesus on the cross daily? that he gave himself for you. And if so, like, as you remind yourself of that, you're, you might be wondering, like, so what do I do now? Like, I, I understand Jesus did this, but what do I do? And, and I think where this story is telling us to go is it's saying, look, worship is what happens when you recognize that on a day-to-day -day basis. I think of worship kind of as, like, breathing. You breathe in the life of God. And as you breathe out, it's, it's worship. That's, that's the breathing out. That's the exhale of your life, is to live a life in worship to God because he's already there in the core of who you are. He's living you, in you in the deepest part of who you are. And so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to go there. And, and that's our response this morning. This, this morning, we are actually going to have an opportunity to worship just for a little bit longer. Um, we're going to take communion together. And this might be just an opportunity for you to take a moment and have some inventory on your own life. I mean, look at what's going on in your life, and it doesn't all have to be bad. It might be a moment to thank God for the, for the work that he's doing in your life, but it might also be an opportunity for you just to be honest with yourself and with God, to speak plainly to him, even in your heart as you take communion, as you remember his sacrifice for you on the cross. And so that's the invitation this morning. Would you join me in prayer? God, we're thankful for you because life can sometimes feel really difficult. And life can also be really joyful and really good. And God, we just thank you for it all. 
we want to say thank you for the difficult moments. We want to say thank you for the good moments. And I just pray that you would purify our minds to be able to see you in it all. Help us to recognize those moments when we tend not to recognize you. And help us to be able to name those moments and say, that's when God was at work in my life. That's when he was there doing work that I couldn't even see. I pray that you would make us more aware of that, God. And God, I also just pray that you'd make us people of worship. Make us people who really enjoy living lives that are for you. We give back our lives to you in sacrifice, but also in joy, Lord. We love to worship and to follow you. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.